Well, thank you very much for a very nice introduction. Thanks a lot. And it's always a pleasure to be here, especially on a sunny day when it's not 80 anymore as it was yesterday. I'm sure that uh, all of us were caught by surprise because you know, we expect Iowa springs to be nice and, uh, and warm as every year. Never snows in April. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's nice to be here and, uh, and thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Thank you for the department. Uh, what I decided to talk about is uh, one of the projects which uh, sort of spans across uh, a variety of applications and uh, I will try to show some of them, uh, probably not all of them. And uh, just as a part of the introduction, the IIBI team is that uh, Iowa Institute for Biomedical Imaging and uh, uh, we have uh, grown over the years uh, to become probably the largest uh, uh, engineering based group of medical imaging uh, uh, faculty in the country. We are now 11 faculty doing medical imaging uh, or medical image analysis at Iowa and uh, at the end I will show you our new building which is uh, uh, you know, very exciting because we now have two floors of uh, imaging space uh, for research uh, imaging only. No patients, no scheduled uh, clinical uh, you know, needs being done there. And uh, uh, the project which I will talk about is uh, Currently in the third uh, phase of NIH funding, it's a pretty basic research for uh, image analysis and has enabled us uh, a variety of applications to be done and uh, done in the optimal way, which is uh, you know, something what engineers are very happy about if you can do it optimally. But from the very beginning, we should of course understand that uh, each optimality statement comes with the uh, you know, substatement that it's optimal with respect to the objective function. And uh, so the catch uh, is uh, how can we get the objective function right so that we can optimize. We can optimize it. Are you optimizing the right thing? So I will talk about a variety of those things. And uh, I will give a little bit of the introduction of the, of the area which I'm going to talk about. And because uh, uh, I know that probably not too many people here are medical imaging people, but we all are patients at one point uh, you know, in uh, physicians' offices. So uh, let's talk about the state of the art of clinical imaging first. And uh, you know that, uh, you know, talking about medical imaging, the medical imaging uh, is everywhere. You know, you go and you get an x-ray, you go and you get a CT scan, you get an ultrasound, um, and so on. But uh, medical image analysis, quantitative medical image analysis, is virtually nowhere. What happens with those images? The physician goes, looks at the image, and says, ah, I see a problem right here. Okay? Then you come next time, you see, I don't see any problem, even if the same thing is there. And uh, so, the image analysis is not really used in clinical care. However, there are some examples of uh, good screening success. And uh, for example, the, the mammography. You know, if, you, uh, you know if, if our wives and daughters uh, uh, and moms uh, get a mammogram, it's uh, almost guaranteed that it will be automatically analyzed. And uh, there will be a, a piece of software will be looking for microcalcifications and for, uh, for some masses uh, in the mammogram. And uh, uh, almost no office now only reads the memogram visually. They almost always use the, the automatic, semi-automated tool. Virtual colonoscopy is another area. Screening in ophthalmology for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, very computerized uh, uh, in this case. Uh, quantitative analysis of uh, internal media thickness in the carotids and uh, making decisions based on the number is uh, common. Cell microscopy for routine laboratory tests. Uh, as well as coronary angiography, quantitative coronary angiography, great examples of uh, how the quantitative medical image analysis is used. Um, but one of the things which you may notice here, it may not be immediately obvious, with some exceptions, almost all those successful application areas are two-dimensional. Okay? So if you look at the ophthalmology, it's a fundus photography, it's a two-dimensional image. If you take mammography, those are projection images from x-ray. Uh, and so on. The virtual colonoscopy is a different, uh, different case. Uh, you see on the right hand side. Cell imaging, again, 2D example, typically. So uh, we are, and we have been in this situation for quite some time, but we are getting closer and closer to the ability to make that step and uh, make that uh, big step from the research uh, area where things like quantitative image analysis is used to the cl routine clinical care where it should be used and allow the uh, patient-specific precision medicine decisions which uh, would be using information that are specific to a specific patient and they are not uh, generalized. So in the research area, 
We all know that our bodies are three-dimensional, and so we would expect that the analysis should be three-dimensional, not two-dimensional as we saw in the previous slide. The function is something what we are always interested in. How do the things function? Not only how they look like, how large they are, but what is the function of those individual things? And if you look at the function, our three-dimensional bodies immediately provide you with uh, higher dimensional information once you include function. If you take a heart, the heart is a three-dimensional object. Once it starts beating, you have the fourth dimension to it, right? And so it doesn't make sense to look at the heart as a three-dimensional object. We all are interested in how the beating is working. What is the ejection fraction? How much blood is being ejected at every heartbeat? So the four-dimensional analysis is necessary if you really want to look at the function of the heart. Now, what is the 5D here? Well, now you can get the beating heart at one point. You can administer some drugs. You can bring the patient again after four weeks and again after another four weeks. And that longitudinal set of images, which each of them is four-dimensional image, becomes a five-dimensional data set. So we can uh, <coughs> very easily understand that we may need to work with five-dimensional data sets, five-dimensional images. Not only that, we also have multimodality imaging. You may have an image that consists uh, of uh, X-ray, CT data, MR data, positive emission tomography data, and so on, ultrasound data. You may get additional dimensionality out of that. And all of that, including the techniques which uh, allow to analyze these images, are widely accepted, widely presented at conferences. But they are not so much accepted by the industry, by the physicians for that matter, or by the FDA, because those methods must be approved so that they can be used on patients. And uh, that's one of the big problems why the automated, semi-automated quantitative techniques are not visible in the clinical practice as much as we would like them to be. This is the second problem. Why, is, why are the physicians the second problem? Well, the one reason is that uh, they don't really know how they should use those numbers. That's one reason. The second is it would, it would slow them down because we engineers are not as good as they would like us to be. You know, they have three minutes per patient. If we add two minutes for analysis, that doubles the number of minutes they have to devote to a patient. Why would they do it? They would cut their salary by, by half, right? So that's one of the problems. Uh, the other problem is that uh, they are much less uh, liable for things if they just look at things, right? You don't have a record which would really say this was the number. You are supposed to know that the tumor is there if this uh, white spot is one millimeter uh, in this direction and five millimeters in that direction. Well, this is just a spot. You know, it's a non-specific mm -hmm. spot if you just look at it and so on. But I think that we are getting there that uh, uh, the physicians start to demand uh, some kind of quantitative analysis. And the major reason for that is that uh, the dimensionality is increasing. If you started with, uh, let's say, pulmonary x-ray, when I was a child or, or even later, that was a single x-ray image, right? The physician looked at that, he or she was done. Now, a scan, the CT scan of the lungs has 600 slices. You have to look at every one of the 600 slices. It takes you some time, right? It's virtually impossible to find everything on those 600 slices. And uh, that's why the industry is offering uh, 3D reconstructions, projection images, and all those things so it makes it easier for the physicians, not necessarily better for the physicians. So one thing which you may want to remember from uh, these two in in initial slides is that uh, we are acquiring a lot of images, and after we acquire the image data with a lot of information, we probably throw away 90% of the information, keep 10% and make the medical decisions on the 10% of information, whatever the percentage may be. Huh? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a different question, but I'm very certain, David, that we are not keeping the right 10%. So uh, getting back a little bit to, uh, to, the, I to the Iowa uh, Institute for Biomedical Imaging, uh, we work in a variety of, uh, of areas. We work uh, in the brain imaging, brain image analysis, in the pulmonary imaging, pulmonary imaging analysis, uh, in the eye, in the heart, uh, in the prostate, for example, for the uh, cancer treatment, the orthopedic imaging for the uh, osteoporosis and uh, 
And uh, interesting. Uh, as well as uh, osteoarthritis uh, for the cartilage uh, assessment, or this is actually a coronary vessel for which the colors uh, represent different tissue types. And uh, in all those cases, you get standard clinical level image acquisition, and then you add some additional information based on the image analysis. Uh, and uh, this is mostly what we are doing uh, at, uh, at IO. So one of the big problems, once you get a three-dimensional or four-dimensional or higher-dimensional data set, is uh, to segment that. And uh, uh, one of the ways how to do that is you get those 600 slices uh, of the lungs, you go to individual slices, you contour the lungs 600 times, and then you put them together and uh, you create some three-dimensional visualization. And uh, if you really do it this way, it's almost guaranteed that you will have some step changes from slice to slice because you cannot really do it contextually well. And uh, so the 3D context is missing. It may be the spatial context in the example I gave, or if you are going over time, it will be a temporal context that will be missing, or both may be missing. And uh, uh, many of you know the dynamic programming that allows to uh, you know, get you from point A to point B in some optimal way if uh, those two points are connected with a graph, two-dimensional graph typically, and uh, uh, that's very useful if you are trying to find a contour on a two-dimensional image. It works really well. And uh, so we tried uh, to extend this 2D dynamic programming to three dimensions, and uh, uh, it really doesn't work very well because you face a problem of the combinatorial explosion. So maybe in um, 1995 or so, uh, you know, the, the group at the University of Iowa came up with uh, a suboptimal approach to to 3D dynamic programming analysis, which um, you know was not that good uh, because it was suboptimal and uh, required a lot of assumptions and heuristics. So we all thought that uh, the optimal detection of surfaces is an MP-complete problem. And uh, there really were no, were no solutions until 2002 when Danny Chen from Notre Dame uh, and uh, Xiao Dong Wu, who was a graduate student at Notre Dame at that, at that time, uh, came with a single surface graph-based solution that was uh, possible to reach at low order polynomial time, and they offered a formal proof of optimality. And uh, because we are working in the dynamic programming area, I got, uh, I think it was an email from Xiao Dong Wu at that time, like 2003 or, or, or so, maybe four, saying, look, you know, we have that technique uh, for 3D graph search and uh, we know it's optimal. Any interest? I said, great. <laughs> and uh, we invited Xiao Dong to come to, uh, to Iowa City for like three weeks in the summer. At that time I had a phenomenal uh, graduate student and they were sitting together and they said, well, uh, let's program it because they offered the formal proof of optimality but I never programmed it. So we wrote the program and we started to do very simple things. I will show you how it actually works. And uh, uh, after that, so, you know, we had problems with like vasculature. And the vasculature, one of the things which is typical is that you need the, the inside wall, you need the outside wall, and you are interested in the wall itself. Is there a plaque, you know, what kind of components you have over there? We say, this is great, single surface, fantastic. What if we do two surfaces? Can we couple them together? And from that idea, this entire thing which I'm going to talk about today emerged and uh, uh, we are using GraphCut for optimization of the graphs, which we are combining. But uh, uh, for those who are doing uh, image processing in computer vision, you may be familiar with the GraphCut segmentation. So we are using the GraphCut for optimization, but not the technique which, uh, which is known as, as Boykov's uh, GraphCut uh, strategy. OK. So we dubbed our technique uh, Logismos, uh, the layered optimal graph image segmentation of multiple objects and surfaces. And as you can see on this slide, we started with that single surface problem, talking about multiple interacting surfaces uh, problem, and went all the way to highly curved surfaces and multiple objects and multiple surfaces and all these things. And I will try to uh, you know, guide us uh, quickly through that. I will not be able to go into much of the detail because I wouldn't be able to get to that uh, just enough interaction paradigm, which I think is exciting. Uh, so I, I, I hope that I will leave you with uh, with uh, you being uh, interested in the general case, you will understand at a high level how it works, and uh, 
we'll be able to talk more, you know, after the talk or or whatever, uh, you know, how far we get. Okay. So let's assume that we have a very simple toy example. Let's say that we have a set of nodes, like that, like that, and these are representing one line of nodes, another line of nodes. We would like to connect these this first line with the other line so that uh, I have a connection between those two lines, those two columns of nodes, which is least expensive, and I only allow to go straight, up, or down. And I think that it's very obvious that if this is the cost of the node, and these are the potential successors, the 45 degrees like that, it's an example, you can do whatever you want, then uh, if I take this particular example at the least expensive way how to get from this column to that column is to connect these two because they give me the cost of two together. If I go that way, the cost would be three, that way it would be nine, and so on. Very clear, very simple, we all see that. Okay. This would be the predecessors on the other side, the same thing. And this number one here shows a constraint which is uh, uh, representing the smoothness of my boundary. How much am I allowing to go and depart from the straight direction? If it is one, I can only go 45 degrees. If it were two, I would be able to go, you know, and connect and make the boundary sort of more, more bouncy, more jagged, okay? So as we already said, this is the optimal solution, and we all see that. And uh, achieving this optimal solution as a search for a path, doing it straight, still seems to be an NP-complete problem. However, if you transform the problem into finding a minimum cost closed set, this problem is uh, known that it can be solved in the low order polynomial time, and there are solutions and libraries that uh, can get you there. So now the question is, how do you transform from a graph, which you can you know, build like this, to a graph for which the cost of the minimum cost closed set would be corresponding to the cost of the upper surface, upper envelope, in the original graph. So if you look at that, the cost of 2, and uh, minus 2, minus 7, plus 8, plus 3, is 2 as well. And if you take any possible envelope in this, uh, in this graph, for example this one, where the cost is 7, those who can add and subtract quickly will find out that the cost of this uh, uh, closed set is 7 as well. So there is a way how to do the transformation of the original graph to a different graph of the same structure in a way that you can apply an efficient uh, search for the minimum cost closed set. It's uh, then being solved by the uh, minimum ST cut algorithm where you have a source of fluid which you are pushing through the graph. You have a sink where the, all the fluid you know, goes through and once you solve that, the uh, part which is connected to the source gives you that minimum cost closed set. The upper envelope of that is your solution, and uh, and you are done. Okay. Yes. So there must be a catch here, right? Because if I can transform my NP-complete problem to another problem from the what, problem. what it means that the first one is not NP-complete, oh. right? Because you can you can do that. Right? Uh, as I say, seemingly mp complete or something that you cannot at least solve directly, or we don't know how to solve it directly. But if you transform it uh, in the proper way, you can do that. And there, there are some, uh, some tricks which I was not talking about how to do the transformation. But, uh, okay, so this is the way how it looks uh, and works in 2D. We don't really need that because we have dynamic programming in 2D, so, so who cares? So how do you do it in 3D? Well, the beauty of uh, this approach is that any, any D works exactly the same as 2D. So if you look at the three-dimensional problem here, again, you have that uh, two set of columns in one dimension. We have the other dimension, uh, which we have other two columns, and now we have like a two-by-two two set of columns. We have uh, the same smoothness constraint which we had, which creates you know, those connections, let's say 45 degrees. The smoothness is one here in both directions, as well as the smoothness will be one in the y direction <coughs> as it is in the x direction, okay? And uh, now, hopefully, we all understand that if you are trying to get a surface here, all what we need is to get the minimum cost closed set, which is underneath, and we already know how to do that, okay? So why is it good? Well, let's look at the right-hand side first. If this is my volumetric image, 
I'm trying to find a surface in the volumetric image, then all what I need to do is to convert, transform the graph which I built, and get the minimum closed closed set which is underneath of that surface, and the surface which is the upper envelope is my solution. Beautiful, right? Well, it's great, but not all the problems are just finding the terrain-like surface um, in, in 3D. If you look at uh, the tubular structure, that is the one which we are interested in the very beginning, the vessel, how does it apply? Well, it actually can be transformed very easily. You just cut it and unfold it. So you cut it from the center someplace here, and you unfold it, and you have exactly this problem. Okay. All right, so we solved that single surface problem, at least uh, in these uh, simple cases, where it's uh, terrain-like or it's tubular. Okay. We'll talk about the more complex cases a little later. And if you do it, if you take it, for example, and apply it to the CT image for the airway, intrathoracic airway segmentation, and do it slice by slice by dynamic programming, you get something that looks pretty reasonable until you get some very weak wall where you can get uh, suddenly you know, a, a solution which uh, is not really compatible with everything what you see before. Okay. What do you mean by that? Uh, I'll give you a sharp, sharp corner or something like that, okay? Well, I mean, you can, uh, if you look here, those uh, smoothness constraints may be location specific. So you may allow, uh, you know, imagine this is a large graph, and in some locations you expect a sharp corner, therefore you sort of have a large departure in one direction and it comes back someplace. If you know where you are, if you know where you are, you can allow the smoothness constraint to be much more relaxed and you know, allowing connecting many different nodes in that area. And uh, assume that you have some a priori knowledge where you allow that. Or you allow it everywhere. Huh? Right, right. And, and, and you frequently do because we are dealing with anatomical objects and uh, we sort of know something about it. There's one more thing which I'll be talking about later because you have to have some way how to start building that graph. And that comes from some a priori segmentation or something. Uh, I'll get to that. So if you do it in 2D, you end up with something that on 3D definitely doesn't look good. If you do it, the same data in 3D, and take the context, the spatial context into consideration, you get something that looks uh, very reasonable as a, as a tube in this case. Yes, this is, this is the 2D, this is the 3D approach. So, what, so in this context, what the 3D is this problem. Yeah, so in that context, what are the nodes and edges of the graph and, and what are the weights of the nodes? Okay, so if you look here, what you would have, you would have uh, uh, like a center of the, of the airway and you would have like a polar coordinate spokes going in all directions. Those spokes would be those individual columns of my graph. And uh, the connectivity would be between this spoke and that spoke, and I would have some, uh, you know, the connectivity which would specify the smoothness of the contour. If, as we talked about with David, if I have the smoothness which allow me to be, do big jumps, I would be able to go perhaps from here to there and to there again and do, you know, something would be very speculated. If I have, uh, if I have zero, the constraint will be zero, I will have to end up with a circle. Correct. What is the meaning of that in this particular case? Okay, so in this particular case, the, the cost which you would have would be associated with the, uh, probably, probably, uh, with the gradient of the image. Okay, because the border corresponds to the high gradient uh, location of the image. So you have to like, process the image to find the gradient. In the simplest case, yes. I see. In the simplest case would be the case. So uh, this is an example of a segmentation of the pulmonary tissue. This is a, a CT image. Uh, um, you think we can make it a little darker here? This is the right thing? No, that was not the right thing. Okay, I think you'll see it better. So this is the lung. The white stuff which is there is the vasculature. So those are vessels. And uh, uh, you, know, you can find those individual fissures you know, our lungs uh, don't come in a single piece. They actually uh, are consisting of uh, 
of three or two pieces based on the site. And uh, the reason is that we want to sit down someplace and uh, you know, those uh, lobes are sliding up on, on each other. So this is uh, one way how you can get uh, a single surface in this, in this area. So uh, if you look at, uh, at a single surface, we have some general understanding how it works. Now let's talk about a double surface uh, approach. So uh, in the dual surface, this is again a toy example, we, have, uh, we are trying to find the inside border and uh, in the same way as we discussed before, let's say that uh, our costs associated with those individual nodes are gradient costs. And so here will be a very strong gradient, here will be a gradient which is not strong at all. And if you are trying to find the strongest contour in this particular image, and you don't use any shape information, this is what you get. And the reason why you get it is that this contour here has a stronger gradient than there. It's actually cheaper overall to depart from here, go there, and then come back to the strong gradient. Right? This is not what you want. We can solve it easily by adding some shape constraint. Something that will say the, the, the contour has to be roughly elliptic. Okay? We can do that. But if you don't use it, this is what we get. So, uh, so the solution which we are trying to find here is something what the humans would do. What would you do if I give you this? You are not going to follow the highest gradient. You sort of say, well, I don't see anything here, but I see something here. I see that those are actually two, two contours which are somehow interacting with each other. And so I will not make a mistake of going there. I will know that I'm supposed to follow this one because if I slow that one, it sort of gives me the context of two contours which I see on this image. So how can I do it in the uh, context of the graph search I described before? Well, let's say it again that we have a little bit more complex example, three by five. This is a dark line and I'm trying to find the upper border and the lower border of this line. We know how to do any single of those, right? We can create a graph. You would allow the straight or 45 degree uh, smoothness of the graph. You put you know, some costs here, for example, this four minus, uh, or one minus four gives you the minus three, really a simple gradient in the y direction, something like that. And uh, you can find a single surface in this graph, you can find the other surface in some other graph, but they will be found independently if you do it that way. Well, another thing what we can, con uh, we can see here is that we know something about that black line. We said the black line is either two pixels thick or one pixel thick in this particular simple example. What it means is that if I have a border here, the other border has to be at most one, two, three pixels below, and at least two pixels below. So I can actually use this a priori information and build a graph accordingly. What I can do, I can say if my upper border is here, then the lower border has to be there or here. And I can do it for all possible locations. And once I do that, another thing should be very obvious. And that is that from two graphs, suddenly I have a single graph. And you know what happens next, right? What I'm going to do next is that uh, I will go and look for the minimum cost closed set. And I will end up with a solution, which should be a surface in this three-dimensional graph. And the surface really will correspond to one border here and a border there. Okay. So if I do this, I can do the solution. This would be the single, single minimum cost close set. And the single close set uh, would give me the solution of those two boundaries, which are the upper envelopes of that single, upper surface of that single close set. Okay. All right, so I can do it for two surfaces. Can I do it for three? Of course I can. I can just add one more graph here and, and link it. If I need one more surface here, I can do it, right? So suddenly I have a way how to do multi-surface simultaneous optimal segmentation. Apply it to this uh, uh, you know, 3D phantom which I had, and I start looking for double surfaces. I will never make the same mistake which I made before. I will end up with the consistent thickness more or less consistent thickness of those two, two surfaces, two borders uh, in this case. Okay. And we can apply it to a variety of applications. 
for example, you can have simultaneous uh, inside outside wall segmentation of intravascular ultrasound image. You can do it uh, in 3D and so do the three dimensional reconstruction of those uh, things if, if you wish, uh, and so on. You can apply it for, uh, you know, to four different, uh, three different borders, four different borders here. Uh, this is an excised iliac artery image by MR, and you can get the inside wall, the plaque here, and uh, you know, different layers of, uh, of the wall, including the media and the tissue. Mm -hmm. I will talk very briefly about the cost, uh, and uh, uh, just because uh, I, I plan to skip it, but I think we should talk a little bit about that. So let's say that we have a situation like here, where we do have, uh, uh, you know, two different surfaces in 3D, the surface between the green and purple, and the surface between the purple and, uh, and the orange or, or, or yellowish or whatever, whatever color that is, okay? And uh, so each of those surfaces has to satisfy the smoothness constraint, and each of the pairs of surfaces satisfy the surface interaction constraint. What do I mean by that? Remember, there's that minimum maximum distance between those two surfaces, okay, which we are talking about before. Now, how do I find the optimal surface cost? Well, it's actually very simple if you think about edge-based cost. If you have a strong edge, the high gradient, you will have a low node cost, and uh, uh, you simply put together a set of all the costs along the entire surface and try to minimize that. Okay. Now, the, the smoothness is uh, right. I mean, the smoothness is derived by the by the derivative of the surface, but you really specify it as a local a local departure from the from the straight plane. This this thing. Right. I mean, if you, if you say that you are looking for a flat surface, the smoothness constraint which we are talking about of going up, straight or down, that smoothness constraint will be zero, you would only be allowed to go straight. Uh, yes. Next bullet. <laughs> okay. So, so this is the way how you can get sort of optimize the, the cost along the surface. But it's not always what you want. You sometimes uh, want to also consider the, the information which is in the region itself. And it's possible, I will not go into the detail, but it's, it's possible to incorporate the regional costs. And uh, so you can have a cost function that would contain together the edge-based costs, each voxel, gradient, or some other information, but associated with the surface only, and then the regional costs that will be associated with all the pixels and voxels which are inside of those regions surrounded by the surfaces. So it's possible you can combine that, you can sort of get the portions from the surfaces and the costs from the, from the regions. And I will not go through that because you don't get anywhere, but I'm trying, I hope I am. Yeah, and I was trying to get to an example where you have an image like that and by combination of the edges, like the edges are very strong here, but not that strong here, right? I mean, we would have, we as humans would have a hard time to find some edge-based information right there between this surface and that surface, right? But it's possible by combination of the regional cost or texture cost, which is associated with those individual layers, you can get, uh, you know, more useful information for your, for your segmentation. All right. So now back to David's question. So how do you deal with, uh, with scenarios when you would like to have some sharp corner someplace or bent, something that is not cylindrical or what is not, uh, you know, flat terrain-like surface? Well, that requires, uh, uh, that actually causing the, the biggest problem of, of this approach. In principle, the principally, principally uh, biggest problem. Because this approach is very good in finding the accurate locations of your surfaces assuming you can build your graph in a way that the desired location of your surface actually is cut through by that column of your graph which we are building. So you have to be able to build that graph first. If you have a, if you have a cylinder, it's easy. It's easy if you have the center line of the cylinder. You get those spokes, 
long enough, you guarantee that you intersect your cylinder. If it's a situation like a, like a liver, for example, or some other object, it may not be that easy. Okay? Especially if you have bands, it may not be easy at all. So uh, the generalization to complex shapes starts with some pre-segmentation. And uh, we have to derive the topology of the object using some approximate segmentation, which guarantees, number one, to have the same topology. So you cannot have different number of objects because the graph approach cannot recover from that. And it's reasonably accurate. It doesn't have to be very accurate, but it's reasonably accurate so that you can build a graph that intersects the desired surface which I'm trying to find. Once you have that, you mesh that object, the pre-segmented object, and uh, uh, once you mesh it, you resample it, and you sort of build perpendicular columns that are associated with of the, each of the faces of that mesh, and uh, off you go. Okay? You construct the graph, you do the graph search in the same way as we, as we have. So this is easy. In situations like this, you create that approximate segmentation, which is the you know, solid line here. This is your true surface you are trying to find. You build your columns that intersect some place here. You build those smooth disconstrained bait interactions between columns, and uh, you are done. The problem which you, of course, will have is in the convex, uh, in the concave areas, like uh, bifurcation of, uh, of two vessels or bifurcation of uh, airways uh, in the lung. If you build the columns in the same way, they will start intersect. You still can solve your graph problem, but it will result in the folding of the surface in this particular case. So one of the ways uh, how to solve that is what we did uh, you know, some years ago. Say, well, we are interested in the airways, but uh, we cannot handle the bifurcations. So you simply ignore the bifurcations. Okay? It was still useful. But at one point, you say, well, actually, we, we should be better than that. And uh, being electrical engineers and having a graduate student in electrical engineering, one of the things what you know is that if you have electric lines of force, they never intersect, right? So you can use that general idea put proper charges on your image and calculate how those columns should look like so they don't intersect. Great. You can use uh, some other things as well. You can use like uh, MRAPs and you can use some gradient uh, vector fields and so on. But this, this, is, this is nice. This works. If you have this as the first surface, the pre-segmentation, which is easy because on CT, this is just air. This is just black. It's easy to segment. The outer wall is not easy to segment at all. But you can use this pre-segmentation to build your graph using those electric lines of force, which uh, never intersect. You can apply your graph search. You probably cannot see that much, but hopefully you do. There's that outer wall surface here. It's better visible on the entire airway tree. So this is a human airway tree. Now you understand, pre-segmented, just the air out, then built one graph for two, the one graph for the inside wall, one graph for the outside wall, linking them together and solving them as a single optimization problem, you get this. Okay. And you can apply it to vascular structure. This is some aortic thrombus uh, from multi-detector CT. But this is how it looks like. This is the inside wall, outside wall, the thrombus in between. It can handle bifurcations and sort of funny shapes, even like that. All right. Then quickly, talking about the multiple objects, because this is another beautiful thing of this approach, that you can handle multiple objects. If you take, a, this is, what is this? This is a knee. This is an MR image of the knee. This is the femur. This is the tibia. We are trying to find the bone and the cartilage surfaces. If you, if you segment the femur independently from the tibia, you can get the bone surface, which is red here, and the cartilage surface, which is yellow here. If you do tibia independently, you get the red and white surfaces. They are individually optimal with respect to the objective function. But if anybody would have a joint like that, they would never bend that knee, right? Because uh, it somehow seems locked and, uh, and put together. This is not the, the right thing. OK. So uh, the way how we can solve that is to take this interaction of those two objects into consideration. You probably know by now what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that uh, we take that one preliminary segmentation from one bone, from the other bone, we link it together with some columns. If uh, you know, I have an example from the prostate and bladder, you pre-segment the images, you get something like this. 
you build one graph for, in this case, uh, for, the, uh, for the bladder and for the prostate. You build some colony chart joint for both objects. And therefore, you can say that uh, the, the distance between those two regions, th those two surfaces, has to be positive. It cannot be negative. They cannot intersect. And so you end up with the graph optimization that will give you, you know, something like that. And if you apply it to the knee, you can do it, uh, you know, for three bones, for the femur, for the uh, tibia, and for the patella. You have six surfaces, three objects. You end up with a segmentation like this. You can calculate where in this image, based on the proximity of pre-segmentation, you should link those two graphs together, where you should let those graphs to be independent, just uh, linking the inside and outside wall. This is how it looks if somebody's knee doesn't uh, look that good. When you have you know, very thin cartilages, where it really will hurt you know, squatting or do something like that. Um, situation. You can combine uh, regions and surfaces as well. You can, for example, have a tumor in the lungs. This is a mega voltage cone beam CT image, a you know, very poor quality image uh, in this case. But you have a diaphragm here, lung here. Very difficult to segment this tumor from the outside wall because it's generally the same brightness, uh, same texture, same everything. This is yet another example sort of the same thing. Again, you have the lung, you know, crappy image, tumor here. But you can uh, do the segmentation by looking at mutual interaction of that object and a region uh, and a surface. So you have a surface of the diaphragm and an object, and you have those linkages here guaranteeing that they will never cross with each other. This is an example of uh, a lymph node which is uh, surrounded by two different surfaces in this case. So you may have a surface, region, surface. And the good thing, you, know, you don't, uh, maybe you shouldn't even say that, but I will say that, uh, this is topologically constrained why the objects inside are not topologically constrained. So you may have multiple different tumors there which should be found uh, uh, at the same time. Um, and one last thing which uh, you know, will hopefully answer David's question about the highly curved surfaces. This is something what is quite recent, maybe half a year old. Uh, you know, I got a very good postdoc uh, who uh, you know, was uh, working in the brain area, came from the University of North Carolina, and uh, we are talking about the logismos approaches, and I sort of uh, said, well, yeah, but in, in the brain, you know, it, uh, it will never work because the uh, salsa and gyri are so curved that uh, you cannot build a pre-segmentation well enough, and even if you do, those columns, you know, they'll intersect everywhere, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it was, it was a good thing to say, especially I found out since then that saying cannot be done really stimulates her, okay? So, so I, I used that several times, but that, no, this cannot be done, and then a few weeks later, you know, Great. So uh, this is an example of uh, the logismos B for the brain, and uh, the same thing which you already saw. And here's the example how those uh, columns are built. So you have the brain, you have the pre-segmentation of the brain, and then you start building those columns using uh, gradient field uh, vector force, again, guaranteeing they don't intersect, you have those individual connections, and the rest is exactly the same as it was before. You have those columns, this is sort of a normal based columns. You see that uh, you know, things are a little messy in some cases. The electric lines of force which didn't work that well because uh, you would have to put too many charges on that, uh, on that surface and it would become computationally very expensive. So with the uh, gradient uh, uh, vector force approach, you know, it worked for us. And uh, once you do that, you end up with uh, you know, much better segmentation with the electric line of force uh, uh, approach simply because you don't have intersecting columns and uh, you know better than the state-of-the-art uh, uh, free surfer approach which is uh, being used uh, heavily. This is the 3D example of the thickness of the cortex uh, uh, for multiple sclerosis patients and, uh, and uh, uh, you know where the other software is uh, underestimating the thickness very heavily. All right. That gets me to the just enough interaction approach. We have a few more minutes uh, to go through that. So uh, everything what I was talking about so far is more or less automatic, right? You get the automated pre-segmentation, you run the automatic, uh, automated graph search, you end up with the solution. It frequently works, but sometimes it fails. All the medical image analysis techniques frequently work, and sometimes they fail. If they fail, what do you have to do? 
you have those 600 slices of the lungs, what do you do? You go to each of one of them and you fix it. Can you imagine a physician doing that? It's not going to happen. Okay? But for the quantitative image analysis to be really used in clinical practice, it means that you cannot have a failure of segmentation, failure of analysis. You have to have 100% success in those, in those patients. You have to have the number which if you want to rely on the number. So what we are trying to push here uh, is uh, find an approach where we will end up with a clinically acceptable result that will be obtained with only a very small increase in the human analysis effort, not slice-by-slice -slice tracing. That was not what I was trying to get to. Um, and so I have some examples here. You may have to uh, you know, go fast here. But uh, uh, here's, the, here's the case, three-dimensional lungs and a tumor here. If you use what you know about lungs on CT, is that the lungs on CT, because they have, uh, they have a lot of air, are black, are dark. If you have a tumor, the tumor is white. You can, if you know where the tumor is, you can modify you know, the search, but you don't know where the tumor is or whether the tumor is there. So it's almost guaranteed that the automated segmentation of the lungs will fail in some ways, for example, like that. Okay? Now, the goal would be to take this image in 3D, for example, and say the border is supposed to be here. Make one point. That one point would give input to the algorithm the algorithm would recalculate, really what it would do would be change the cost in some proximity of the point which you make, uh, redo the optimization of the graph and give you a better solution. And this is exactly what's happening in this case and, uh, and you will see uh, how we are doing that. We have a three-dimensional visualization environment which in some cases we use, in some cases we don't. So stereo vision with tracking cameras and all those things. And uh, we can get uh, the visualization of the lungs uh, you know, being done like that. You have the left and right lung. You have the CT images underneath. Uh, you have uh, the CT image, which is sort of shown for context here. The red thing is the trachea uh, around this image. And so the refinement, the just enough interaction thing, is to provide just enough user input so that the solution is clinically usable. So in this case, you can see that you have to know where to use. And, but any time you get the automated segmentation, you have to go through that and see whether you are happy or not. Right? I mean, that, that's the reality. You may, have, you may be able to run some quality control and get, the, get it automatically, sure. But, uh, but not always possible. So, so in this case, you do a very quick you know, view of things. You find out that you have some white structure here, some white mass, which is not segmenting the lung quite well. So you do you go there with the interaction pen, you make a point, you modify the costs around that point, and you recalculate that, uh, that graph as I was talking about it. So you have those individual columns here, you make the manual point, you find out that there are similar costs you know, around, uh, uh, around the contour of the surface, and you recalculate that. Okay? So this is how it looks in reality. This is the three-dimensional image. This is how you find out that you have something wrong. You actually can see it visually quite well on the 3D reconstruction frequently. You can bring the underlying CT image. Then you can say, okay, here's my point which I would like to see. Maybe switch into the contour view. Right? Uh, and, uh, and once you so do the inspection, you have the contour in this particular frame. You see the green dot. The green dot is being put there. You sort of make, have, make sure you are happy uh, with everything. And you recalculate, you re-optimize your graph. And uh, you know, despite how long it takes here, actually, it's pretty fast. And uh, I think uh, now you can see that straight line over there. You can see it in blue. Hopefully, you can see it from the back. But you'll be able to see it on the 3D view once we bring it on. And uh, so now you can see th which portion was automatically identified as needing the modification of the costs and uh, how it was based on that single point uh, re-optimized and fixed so that you don't have a problem uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in, the, in the segmentation. Okay. Similar, similar approach uh, can be used if uh, the lung 
mistakenly includes a portion of the trachea in the segmentation. If you have very you know, narrow line, sort of narrow wall between the lung and the trachea, you may need that uh, single point as you saw here. And uh, once you do this, uh, you end up with, uh, uh, you know, with the three-dimensionally correct segmentation. You go through that, you review it, and uh, you should be reasonably happy uh, by receiving the outcome. So here's an example how it uh, looks before the refinement, for example, and uh, after you refine it, what you end up with, uh, you know, being fixing, being fixed after just inserting few points in there, and just uh, you know, comparing the errors, the errors are much larger than they are after in the area of interaction, as one would expect. Now, uh, you can also do it in 4D. You can use this just enough interaction approach to interact with one face and fix the entire four-dimensional part of your image. So what this is, this is again the lung, this is in uh, inspiration, this is expiration. And uh, uh, what, uh, what we have, uh, like the 4D refinement, get the same similar situation, you see the, the changes in the expiration inspiration, right? Now, inspire, expire, okay? You have the problem which we saw before as well with the trachea. You put one point in one phase, not in both, just in one phase, you fix it, and you fixed it in the entire 4D. Okay, now you can see that uh, it's sort of corrected in both phases, inspiration, expiration in this, in this particular case. And uh, you end up with uh, you know, reasonable, reasonable segmentation based on that single interaction point, you are inter you know, fixing the entire 4D image. Um, just two or three minutes left. So uh, similarly, in the intravascular ultrasound, very difficult segmentation problem. You know, trying to find this outer wall, especially in some uh, cases, is not easy at all. Uh, you can get uh, some additional information, but uh, this is how the images typically look like if you put the intravascular catheter inside of the, of the vessel. Uh, you can do three-dimensional visualization, but not, not that critical. Now, if we have a longitudinal sort of axial image, axial view of things, uh, you may see that uh, in some cases the segmentation, the initial segmentation is wrong, the two surface segmentation. You enter some approximate location, it gets fixed. So the way how it works is shown here at the bottom. You get an automated segmentation and you see that in these areas the segmentation is not right. You put some points here, it, recompu it recomputes everything in 3D here, so you see only one plane through the 3D, but it actually happens you know, throughout the entire 3D thing. And so again, the similar scenario, in this case we don't need a three-dimensional interface, we can do it just on screen in 2D, and uh, by putting several points in that, we fix the segmentation, and this is something what we are using for a project which previously required like two to three hours of technology's time to do the editing, we never were able to get a physician to do it. Now the physician can actually do it in about six minutes. Okay. And uh, I think I have, maybe I don't have. Uh, okay, so this is the example how the uh, uh, segmentation looks like. This is the independent standard. This is after a few clicks. And the interaction time was uh, about six minutes per case compared to two to three hours. And the computational time is actually about 86 plus minus something milliseconds. The rest is the human interaction time trying to find where to click and, and review the entire sequence. All right, so getting to the end. So n-dimensional medical image segmentation is clearly important because we are dealing with n-dimensional medical data. The fact that the logismos approach guarantees the optimality is bringing some favorable properties because we can claim that this is the best solution of them all and of course the problem is in the cost function. We have to design the cost function well. And we are either acting as the designers of the cost function if you know how, or we can use machine learning approaches to design the cost function. We can learn how those individual maybe textures of the layers look like, how the properties of those individual uh, surfaces look like. We can learn how different the surface properties are in different locations of, 
our objects, we typically have some knowledge of the anatomy, so we can have uh, you know, some, uh, some relationship. The multi-surface, multi-object interaction context is helping tremendously, because if you have situations like uh, in the knee joint uh, and so on, uh, it helps a lot. So we have applied it uh, up to 11 surfaces now, up to three objects with six surfaces total, 4D data, in ophthalmology, orthopedics, cardiovascular area, pulmonary, various tumors, uh, liver, diaphragm, and so on. So it actually became a pretty much a workhorse uh, uh, of uh, many projects which we have uh, at Iowa now. And the just enough interaction is uh, far strengthening the overall approach. And uh, we hope that uh, this just enough interaction will be good enough that we'll be able to bring it uh, as a true part of the workflow for radiation treatment. Uh, uh, for identification of tumors and other areas, uh, other regions, other organs that perhaps should not be irradiated and should be, uh, should be spared. So as I promised, uh, you know, we have this new building at Iowa, and if you are in Iowa City, for whatever reason, let me know and uh, I'll come to show you around. So we have two floors in this area here now just for imaging, and uh, we will have, we have some beautiful toys, and we will have more beautiful toys uh, as we get uh, some beautiful money. All right, thank you.